Scientific names can be a lot of complicated Latin gobbledygook that are both hard to pronounce and spell. They can also change sometimes frequently as our understanding of genetics and evolutionary history grows. The animal we're talking about today, though, has probably the easiest scientific name to write and say of just about any animal on the planet. I'm not even kidding, the scientific name for the green iguana is literally Iguana Iguana. I mean... So in our last animal spotlight video, we talked about a reptile native to Florida, the Florida king snake. Today, on the other hand, we're talking about an animal that you will find in Florida, but they're not really supposed to be there. And anyone that has been to Florida or even heard about Florida has definitely heard about them. And like I said, they're not native to Florida. There's just a metric crap ton of invasive ones there. I'm joined by Levi, who you previously saw in one of our videos where the green iguana actually took home the crown for being the worst beginner pet reptile available at pet stores because they make truly terrible pets for 99% of people. But remember today, in Animal Spotlight videos, we don't talk about captive care, we're just talking about them in the wild. So breaking it down, they're in the Kingdom Animalia, the Phylum Chordata, the class Reptilia, because they are a scaly, cold-blooded reptile, and then they're in the order Squamata, which is snakes and lizards. They're in the suborder Iguania, which is a huge group of lizards with a lot of species in it. You got your chameleons, all of your iguana species, you've got a gamid lizards, a bunch of animals are in this group. And then they're also in the family Iguanidae, which is mostly New World lizards, and you have your iguanas in it, you have other groups of lizards like annals and collared lizards, but these lizards have pleurodont dentition, and that's something that the chameleons and other agamid lizards don't have, so they're not in this group. Lastly, like I said, they're in the genus Iguana. Do you see a pattern here? Now, in this genus, there are actually only three iguana species. Your rock iguanas, rhino iguanas, spiny-tailed iguanas, marine iguanas, none of them are in this genus. The only three in it are the green iguana, the saban black iguana, and then the lesser antillian iguana. These lizards are on the larger end for the iguana group, and they have these really cool big dewlaps that they can fan out. And they also tend to have longer, kind of skinnier tails than a lot of your other iguana species, like your rock iguanas, the cyclura, they have this big, beefy round tail. They were first officially described in 1758 by Carl Linnaeus himself. He's kind of dubbed the father of modern taxonomy because he helped create this system where you have a two-part name for every organism. You take the genus and the species. So for iguana, it's iguana iguana, for humans, it's Homo sapien, for bearded dragons, you got Pagona fidiceps, things like that. Green iguanas are one of, if not the largest iguana species alive. They're actually one of the largest lizards on the planet alive today, I would say. The only group of lizards that really outsize them as a whole are your really big varanid lizards, your monitor lizards like Komodo dragons, water monitors, croc monitors, things like that. But I would personally argue the green iguana is probably the most iconic, famous, well-known lizard alive, both in name and image. I can't tell you how many times I've been at a program and someone asks if the bearded dragon or gecko I'm holding is an iguana. It's just a ton, even the general public, a ton of people know about iguanas. They can easily hit five to six, even seven feet for the big males in length. They are a truly massive lizard and they have a very, very distinct profile. They come in a wide variety of colors and patterns. Not all green iguanas are green, mind you. And probably just over the last two centuries, many of these locales and different variations, they were thought to be different subspecies. But again, as our knowledge grew and we realized that genetically they're all exactly the same, it's just their kind of patterns and coloration might differ. They were really just regional variants of of the same species. Some get really dark bands going down the body, some get bluish or whitish or yellowish highlights, some are just super bright obnoxious green like you might picture with a green iguana, some are red. Then you've got exanthic iguanas which are blue, which if you remember from the Florida king snake video where Captain Jack was exanthic, that means they don't have yellow skin coloration. So if you take the yellow out of green, you get a big blue iguana. And some say if you unite all six of the affinity iguanas in the iguantlet, you can obtain unimaginable power. Where did that bring you? Back to me. 
when they're younger, it's basically impossible to outwardly tell if you have a male or a female iguana. But as they get older, the males become very easy to identify. Males get much larger, usually 8 to 15 pounds, and they grow much taller dorsal spines going down the back of the body than the females get. Females usually max out at like 3 to 5, maybe 6 pounds for a really big girl. And the males also get these super big chubby jowls. Now, not quite as big as the tegus can get, but they're still very impressive. Naturally, the green iguana is found about halfway through South America, up into Central America, and into the southern edges of Mexico. They're also natively found on a few different islands in the Caribbean, like Granada and Aruba, but unfortunately they've been introduced into a bunch of the other islands in the Caribbean. They're causing a lot of problems, but more on that in a minute. They are an arboreal lizard, so they like areas with a lot of trees, ranging from tropical rainforests to the woods behind many people's houses. They aren't opposed to being terrestrial burrowers either, though, so they'll also hang out on beaches, grassy plains, forest clearings, uh, golf courses, things like that. Now you can start to see why these guys can become a huge invasive problem. They hit sexual maturity about three to four years of age and male iguanas do pretty typical stuff as far as lizards trying to find a lady. They'll do things like puffing out their cheeks, fanning out their dewlap, bobbing their head, things that normal in the lizard world but if human male tried to do it he'd look very weird. A female can lay anywhere from 20 to 60 eggs annually per clutch. That is a lot of babies. And yet another example of how green iguanas can be really problematic as an invasive species because they reproduce like crazy. Now compare that to a reptile like the pancake tortoise, which lays a single egg per clutch, and you can kind of see the difference because no one is invading anywhere at a rate of one new baby a year. Little babies hatch out after 10 to 15 weeks of incubation and they usually hang out at the trees to avoid more predators. The juveniles tend to stay in large groups for the first year or so of their life since there's no parental protection. Does my armpit smell good? What are you doing? Yes, that is armpit. Hello. Oh, are you coming up now? Hi. You gonna hang out there? Okay. These are a very big arboreal lizard. And they've actually been witnessed jumping out of the tops of tree canopies, 60, 80, 100 feet in the air, jumping off, surviving the fall to the ground and running away like nothing happened. They are amazing swimmers. And like I said, also very capable burrowers and left unchecked with little predation, they can cause huge amounts of damage to natural and man-made landscapes. And this is what you're seeing a lot in Florida because along the riverbanks and waterways, they are just absolutely destroying a lot of that land which causes erosion and other property damage and things like that they're just in huge numbers they are very devastating to areas they are also very cold tolerant a lot of you have probably seen the news headlines or videos of frozen iguanas falling out of trees and stuff like that and people going over and finding them and then as soon as the sun comes up they warm up they walk away like nothing happened with this cold tolerance with their body being able to take such low temperatures into the 20s and 30s frozen snow all this stuff they are going to be again a very very problematic invasive species in the long run they are going to be able to move much farther north into the united states out of florida than other kind of popular invasive animals like the bernese python ever will they have quite a few defense mechanisms a lot of tricks up their sleeve first one is to just run away i mean they are very very fast with those nails they can climb a tree very very quickly and if a predator follows them up the tree and they're near a water source they'll actually dive like i said they'll either dive on the ground or they'll dive into the water itself hold their breath they'll go down and they'll hang out at the bottom of the pond river wherever they'll hang out at the bottom for a few minutes and wait for the predator to leave before they resurface now they also have this tail so when they're younger like we talked about back in the leopard gecko spotlight video, a lot of lizards can drop their tail, it'll keep wiggling, and the predator will focus on that while they run away, and they'll eventually grow a new one. When you get a big green iguana, though, they kind of stop dropping their tail. They start using the tail as a weapon itself. This tail is basically like a razor-sharp belt on steroids. This tail leaves a big, big bruise. It is very, very rigid. And all of these scales on the tail come to a very sharp tip. It's kind of like shark skin, where if you pet this way, you're okay. You pet the other way, you're gonna cut your hand up. So when they go to tail whip, you're gonna not only get bruised, you're gonna get a whole bunch of scratches. And just trying to keep them on the table for filming this video, I've already cut my hand up a little bit. Just by trying to kind of grab the tail and hold on to them, you get torn up. So a lot of people that have green iguanas or work with them, you definitely want to use gloves. Last up is their bite. Green iguanas have some seriously wicked sharp teeth. They have a nasty bite. It is not something you want to mess with. Now tegus like Nora, I'm in my black and white tegu, they have an adult male can bite down with like 300 pounds per square inch of jaw strength. They have some super strong jaws. Iguanas, I think an adult green iguana clocks in somewhere in the low 200s 
pounds per square inch, so it's not as strong. But Norman's teeth got nothing on Levi's teeth. Green iguanas have some seriously sharp teeth. Tegu teeth aren't all that sharp. So if you ever go down to Florida and you ever see like wild iguanas and you want to do stupid touristy things, don't. A lot of iguanas have been conditioned by people to be fed by them. But if that iguana jumps up, misses the food you're offering and it gets your hand instead, that's a trip to the ER. Males can have a super nasty attitude about them and they can get really territorial. And in captivity, this leads to a lot of unhappy and bleeding iguana owners. At programs, when I tell people about these wickedly sharp teeth, a lot of people assume they are carnivores, but it's actually the opposite. They are 100% herbivore. The odd juvenile might eat a bug or a snail or something if it's really, really hungry, but generally they're 100% salad eaters. They're not chasing down vertebrate prey. They eat a bunch of different things like leaves, grasses, weeds, wild fruit, fruits, flowers, really just about any type of plant material they can find in nature. In the wild, their primary predators are birds of prey like hawks and eagles. When they're small though, lots of things are going to eat them. You've got reptiles like snakes and crocodilians. You've got mammals co like coatis and ocelots. You've got other birds like herons and storks. Once they grow up, however, and start putting on some weight and length, you'd be very hard pressed to find a hunter that wants to mess with a six to seven foot giant angry lizard. There is one exception to this though. There is one predator in the Amazon rainforest. It's the king of the Amazon rainforest forest that can and has gone after adult green iguanas. If you remember back from the red foot spotlight video, the very first animal spotlight video we ever did, the king of the rainforest, the jaguar. They do eat green iguanas. Again, green iguanas, adult ones, not really their preferred food. There are e other easier things to eat in the rainforest, but they can eat them. Besides the jaguar, they are also a big food source for humans in just about all of their range. And in some areas, they're even farmed for meat as well. What are you doing? Okay. Now globally, the green iguana is clearly in no danger of really ever going extinct. But in its actual home range, not in all of its invasive territories, but in its home range in certain countries, they are actually starting to become vulnerable to extinction. Because of decades of over collection for food and the pet trade, in certain parts and countries of their home range, they are starting to decline in population. Now, obviously, you want these animals out of places they're not supposed to be. We don't want green iguanas in Florida. We don't want them in all these other places they're not supposed to be found. But where they are supposed to be, you don't want to see their populations decline. They've been introduced to so many different fragile island ecosystems they're not supposed to be in all across the planet. You got Puerto Rico, Fiji, Hawaii, and then of course, like I've said multiple, multiple times, they're like everywhere in Florida. Now, they eat a lot of native endangered plants. They take away food from native endangered species. They outcompete them. Like I said, the burrowing is causing huge problems for landscaping and irrigation along roads and housing. And like I said, there's a bunch of tourists, especially in Florida, think it's really cool to feed the giant armies of little green lizards that sometimes are very big, their bites hurt. And here in the 21st century, there are still people that haven't figured out you're not supposed to feed wild animals. Now the stereotype with a lot of these invasive reptiles in Florida, like your Burmese pythons, tegus, green iguanas, is that they were pets that people didn't want anymore, so they let them go. I'm sure a very small fraction of these lizards Sure, we're from people that didn't want them anymore, were irresponsible, let them go into the wild. Same with, I'm sure a very small fraction of them were probably iguanas that were kept outdoors in improper housing, got loose, and were never seen again. But really, this did not come, this did not start, this did not snowball into this from some released pets. These animals, iguanas, have been found in Florida and these islands for upwards of 100 plus years. The grand majority of them were brought over on purpose. They were brought over as a food source for travelers, and then also some probably did hitchhike on ships, and then a good number of them were also released when hurricanes did damage to breeding facilities and things like that, and a bunch of them got out in droves. But again, this did not start because a few people released pets they didn't want anymore. These lizards are spreading like wildfire, and with how sturdy they are, how cold tolerant they are, with how much they eat, and how quickly they can reproduce, they are going to end much, much farther than just Florida, and I'll bet money on that. Now on a lighter note, green iguanas are one of the best examples for having a third eye. And what I mean by that is they don't see with it. It doesn't help them see their surroundings. It doesn't help them see into the future psychically or anything like that. They use this, it's called a parietal eye. It's purely photosensory, it does not make images. It's for light and movement detection. It helps them find the kind of brightest basking spots with the most UV exposure, and then it also helps them pick up on a predator if it's circling overhead. Now this parietal eye is something that a lot of lizard species have, but a green iguana is kind of the easiest to find it. 
They're also surprisingly fast runners. They can hit a max speed of about 20 miles per hour, which is probably much faster than I can run right now, given all my physical inactivity because of quarantine. Now this one's not so much of a fun fact. It's a little depressing, but green iguanas can live 50 to 60 years in captivity. That's like one of the longest lived lizard species. And besides turtles and tortoises, that's like one of the longest lived reptile species. But despite this in captivity, probably maybe one in 10 lizards actually make it past the first year of their life because so many people buy baby green iguanas at pet stores and they're not prepared they don't give it the right setup and the green iguanas get stressed out they were wild caught so many factors and they just don't make it so unfortunately despite them being able to live so so long a lot of them don't even make it through the first year also despite the green iguana like we said being in really no danger of going extinct there are many iguana species that are endangered or critically endangered. Some are actually so close to extinction, there's only a, a few dozen left in their home range in the wild. And some of them are pushed to that point by being outcompeted by the bigger, more aggressive, more bratty green iguana, like you. So that was our animal spotlight on the green iguana. Make sure you like the video if you learned something. Comment down below if you've ever seen a green iguana in the wild, whether it was in Florida or where they're actually supposed to be. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any of our future animal spotlight videos or really any of the animal videos I post every week. Thanks for tuning in and I'll catch you later. Cold tolerant, they can eat just about any type of plant thing. Yes. <laughs>